Good evening from Brussels, and welcome to the first direct line webinar hosted by the U.S. Mission of the European Union, featuring Ambassador William Kennard. My name is Joe Burke, an economic officer with the Department of State, and I'll serve as the moderator for the webinar this evening. Our format tonight is quite straightforward. Ambassador Kennard will begin with brief opening remarks. Then we'll have an extended question and answer session, which will take us to the top of the hour. We've had over 90 people sign up for the webinar, and many of you have submitted questions prior to today. Okay, we've taken some of those questions, and we'll start with those. However, we'll be taking questions throughout the course of the hour, and you are encouraged to send additional questions. Okay. There should be a screen below the picture that you're seeing of me on your computer. You can type in a question there. If you hit enter, it will disappear from your screen and it will appear on the computer we have here in the studio, and I will relay your question to Ambassador Kennard. With that housekeeping aside, it's my great honor to introduce Ambassador Kennard. William Kennard was nominated to be Ambassador to the European Union by President Obama in August 2009 and was confirmed by the U.S. Senate for the position in November 2009. Prior to assuming his position as Ambassador to the European Union, Ambassador Kennard served as Managing Director of the Carlyle Group, where he specialized in investments in telecommunications and the media sector. Ambassador Kennard served as the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission during the Clinton administration. Prior to that, served as the general counsel of the Federal Communications Commission. Okay. Prior to serving in the Clinton administration, Ambassador Kennard was a partner and member of the board of directors of the Washington, D.C. law firm now known as DLA Piper. Ambassador Kennard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe, and thank you to all of our audience out there watching today and participating in the first of what I hope will be many direct line webinars that uh, we can do with U.S. businesses interested in the European Union. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton initially had the idea that American businesses, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, might find it useful to speak directly to U.S. ambassadors about doing business overseas. We think it's a great idea. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak today to business representatives watching all across the U.S. and here in Europe. As the United States Ambassador to the European Union, I'm uh, an ambassador not to an individual European country, but I'm responsible for managing the U.S. relationship with the institutions of the European Union. So my hope today is to provide a general perspective for businesses on transatlantic trade, investment, employment, and to describe as best as I can what the U.S. government and the EU institutions are doing to promote jobs, growth, and competitiveness on both sides of the Atlantic. And frankly, in doing so, I hope to dispel some of the, the myths and caricatures that one sometimes hears about Europe. Uh, while Europe today clearly faces some difficult economic challenges, and, and we can discuss those challenges if you like, Europe is also our most important economic partner in an increasingly global economy. There's a lot of opportunity here, and, and businesses who understand what Europe has to offer and understand why U.S. businesses have such deep ties to Europe are those that are the best placed to seize the many rich commercial opportunities that exist today and will continue to exist in doing business uh, here in Europe. So uh, first let me talk a little bit about the EU as an entity. What is the EU and how is it positioned on the world stage? And forgive me uh, uh, those of you who are, have specialized knowledge of the EU, but I, I thought that I would start by just giving a brief overview of the history and, and purpose of the European Union. The precursor to the EU was called the European Economic Community, or the EEC, and initially included uh, six member uh, countries. Uh, the first member states were uh, Belgium, uh, Germany, France, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. The EEC was conceived uh, in the af aftermath of the Second World War, and its initial premise was really simple, and it was the notion that if you could provide greater economic interdependence between member states, there would be less likelihood of armed conflict between those states. And it worked. It, it worked tremendously well. In fact, it, it, it worked so well that just this year in October, the EU as an institution was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. 
Uh, and this was a really important reminder of the success of the original EEC in achieving this initial goal of, of peace and prosperity in Europe. So we have a unique relationship with the EU. We have uh, uh, a history of, uh, of uh, common values, a shared history, uh, and it is, uh, it is those shared values that has led to the creation of what is the most dynamic and robust economic relationship that the U.S. enjoys with any other part of the world. The EU is uh, by far our largest economic partner. In our invitation to participate in this webinar, we provided some statistics on the amounts of trade and investment between the U.S. and the EU, just in order to give people uh, a sense of the, the size and strength of the transatlantic economic relationship. So I'm, I'm not going to belabor those statistics. They are pretty impressive. You'll see them in the invitation. But just let me add uh, a couple of points to that, which I think are really important, particularly at a time of high unemployment. We hear a lot of stories of uh, U.S. and European firms aggressively seeking cheaper labor markets uh, outside the U.S. and the EU and Asia, Central America, other places. But in fact, if you look at the numbers, most foreigners working for U.S. companies outside the U.S. are European. And most foreigners working for European companies outside the EU are American. So our, our two economies employ more Americans and more Europeans than anywhere else in the world. Now, the private sector on both sides of the Atlantic is clearly the driving force behind the strong economic ties between the U.S. and the EU. Uh, most of these jobs, uh, all of these jobs virtually are created by, uh, by the private sector. But I want to talk briefly about the role that governments play in facilitating and promoting this economic relationship. Under the Obama administration, the U.S. government has enjoyed exceptionally good cooperation with the governments of the EU member states on political and security issues. As Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has said, many times, Europe is and remains our partner first resort on the world stage. And it, it may be perhaps less well known that the governments of the U.S. and the EU work very closely together, day in and day out, on economic issues of common concern. The U.S. government and the EU institutions seek uh, transparent, fair, and simple rules for trade and investment to minimize our bilateral disputes knowing that under those conditions our respective private sectors will be incredible engines for jobs and growth in the global economy. In many ways, we set the standard for open and transparent markets for the rest of the world. And while our governments work together on many uh, multilateral and bilateral issues, uh, both formally and informally, much of our work together in the last few years has been done under the auspices of what we call the Transatlantic Economic Council, or the TEC, which is in many ways uh, the most important vehicle for our, uh, our cooperation on economic issues. We have many, many work streams in the TEC. There are many topics, such as promoting opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, exploring uh, some new and exciting uh, industries like electric vehicles, electronic health records, uh, nanotechnology. We're working on uh, strengthening uh, the investment principles that we live by, trying to, to provide uh, more secure trade and customs cooperation, just a lot of things going on. We also have uh, a group called the High Level Regulatory Cooperation Forum, which we usually refer to simply as the forum. And this is an effort to find ways that we can harmonize our regulatory systems and get rid of what we call behind the uh, the border barriers to trade, non-tariff regulatory barriers. So while both of our regulatory systems are founded on the same basic premise of protecting the health and welfare of our citizens and the environment, the systems often achieve their objectives in different ways. They're, we have different structures and processes. And so we spend a lot of time just trying to find ways to converge our systems so that businesses uh, find that there's less tension in the way that they do business in the transatlantic marketplace. Now, not surprisingly, you know, we, this is not perfect and 
Uh, there are regulatory barriers uh, to trade, and the forum is always working on trying to identify those tensions and problems and minimize them uh, going forward so that we can uh, prevent obstacles to trade. It's a, it's a huge undertaking that we have going here. Um, and lastly, we have what's called the US-EU Energy Council, which presents an opportunity for senior leaders from Europe and the United States to discuss energy security and efficiency objectives. And they talk about new technologies in the energy field. In fact, um, as we speak, Secretary Clinton is, is in Brussels. Uh, she's uh, here for a series of meetings and will be meeting with the Energy Council tomorrow uh, to uh, advance the work of the, of the Energy Council. So uh, we've done a lot through these vehicles and we have periodic summits at the presidential level between the U.S. and the E.U. Our last summit was a little over a year ago when President Obama and his two counterparts uh, in the E.U., the President of the European Commission and the President of the European Council, uh, sat down and talked about a range of issues. But importantly, they announced the formation of a high-level working group to evaluate how we can deepen our economic relationship to create more jobs and growth on both sides of the Atlantic. So they set up this, this working group. It's co-chaired by Ron Kirk, uh, our U.S. trade representative in the United States, and then on the EU side, Carol de Gucht, who is the EU trade commissioner. And they were tasked by the heads of state with identifying ways that we can increase trade and investment uh, to deepen our relationship. The working group has been uh, hard at work for um, uh, about a year now. Uh, they have been working with the private sector and all the stakeholders, public sector, members of Congress, members of the European Parliament. Uh, they've received uh, a lot of feedback. Uh, they haven't come out yet with a final set of recommendations, but we expect that uh, sometime soon, perhaps end of the year or, or sometime in, into next year. And they're working on the whole range of trade issues uh, between the U.S. and the EU, trying to identify long-standing barriers to trade and market access, and seeing where we can uh, perhaps uh, find ways to liberalize and open uh, our markets, shore up our global competitiveness for the next century, that ideally will create uh, more jobs and, and could be billions of dollars of, uh, uh, of uh, benefit to our economies. So uh, we're awaiting the outcome of the, uh, the report of the working group. Again, it'll probably be end of this year, maybe uh, uh, sometime next year. But uh, in my three years as ambassador here, we've never really had, a, uh, I think, a more robust discussion about how we can, we can deepen and expand our economic relationship. Uh, I want to say uh, uh, just a couple of words about the Eurozone crisis. Of course, uh, in, in recent years, both the U.S. and countries here in Europe have been dealing with pretty serious financial and fiscal challenges. Uh, uh, the Eurozone crisis has presented a, a, a particularly complex challenge here in Europe. Uh, it's a challenge that the governments and people of Europe uh, are working on. That It's an issue that only they can really resolve. And while only 17 of the 27 members of the EU actually use the euro as their common currency, the eurozone crisis has had a ripple effect throughout Europe and indeed throughout the world and clearly has impacted the United States in various ways. So we are pleased to see that uh, there appears to be a fair amount of good progress that's been achieved recently. Hopefully governments here are setting conditions to move beyond the crisis. I think it's worth emphasizing that after three years of uh, vigorous debate and about a dozen elections in Europe, uh, the 17 governments of the Euro area remain united in their will to maintain Europe's monetary union, preserve their currency. And I think that's good not only for Europe, but certainly good for the United States and the global economy. Uh, so I'd like to close uh, just by noting that uh, the U.S. mission to the EU here in Brussels is a very dynamic mission. We have a, a large interagency team dedicated to working with and on behalf of U.S. businesses and industries. Uh, like our own government in Washington, uh, the institutions of the European Union can appear sometimes complex and hard to navigate. Uh, but 
Uh, we have very strong relationships with all the branches of the EU institutions, the Commission, the Council, the Parliament, uh, as well as many of the other agencies that uh, are lesser known. And our mission here uh, in Brussels is sort of like a, a, a small version of our, of our government in the United States. We have multiple agencies represented here, uh, a, a whole range of economic agencies, the Department of Commerce, Agriculture, Treasury, Homeland Security, uh, the USTR, our U.S. Trade Rep Office, and we're working every day on behalf of U.S. interests to strengthen transatlantic economic ties in a way that leads to jobs and growth. Now, I certainly cannot suggest that our mission can solve every commercial issue that you face in Europe, but businesses should be aware that the U.S. mission here in Brussels includes a very experienced group of professionals. We're here to work with you on any number of issues and in a variety of ways. Uh, our, our trade and investment ties with Europe already run deep, but there are always opportunities to deepen and expand trade and investment ties uh, uh, to promote jobs and growth and profits uh, uh, in both our economies. So we'd like to help you. Uh, we have uh, people here who are very expert. They're available to answer your questions. We'll try to answer some of your questions on this webinar, but hopefully this is just an introduction to our mission and what we do. And so with that, uh, Joe, I'll turn it back to you, and hopefully we can get to some of the questions. Thank you, sir. As I noted at the beginning, we've had a number of questions already, and uh, a number of the questions were from small companies with new and innovative sounding products asking about how to enter the EU market. So uh, sort of a paraphrase <laughs> of some of these questions we've received, but can you provide any insight on a market entry approach for companies seeking to enter the EU market for the first time? Well, I think the most important thing is to understand that the EU is not a monolithic economy. It's 27 different economies, cultures, many different languages, different regulatory environments. Before I got this job, I was uh, in the investment world, and I, I did business in Europe, primarily in the, the telecom and, uh, uh, and media sectors. And to be a smart investor in Europe, you really have to look uh, not only country by country, but you also have to look sector by sector, market by market. Uh, you have to do your homework. You know, particularly for small businesses, uh, you really have to understand where the market opportunity is. Um, when I was investing here uh, in the cable television industry, we actually created a matrix where we, we looked at the the regulatory and business environment every, of every EU uh, country. And then you can zero in on those opportunities that uh, are, are most, most, most worthwhile. But you also have to keep your eye on the EU because the EU institutions actually write about 80% of the regulation that governs Europe or governs the EU. Uh, and so you have to understand how local laws and regulations affect your business and how the EU uh, laws and regulation affect your business. Um, we're focused a lot now on small and medium-sized businesses because we know that they really are the engine of job creation and growth, both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the president has announced a national export initiative, which is a really important uh, initiative to help expand exports from the United States to around the world, but um, uh, including in Europe. And uh, so we're putting a lot of effort behind this, but know where the resources are. The Department of Commerce has a wonderful network of, of, of uh, commercial service operations throughout the United States. So if you're watching this uh, from the U.S., you should know who your, where your um, um, uh, commercial service office is in your local community. Um, use it. Uh, they can provide information. They can connect um, you with professionals here in Brussels uh, who can help you. Uh, and uh, uh, do your homework. There are a lot of resources available to you. Thank you. We've also had a number of questions about the high-level working group that you mentioned. In particular, uh, questions that focused on whether any prospective agreement we have with the EU would cover agriculture. So can you comment on whether agriculture will be part of any possible U.S.-EU trade agreement? Well, when the, uh, the EU and the U.S. Uh, made an interim report to uh, the heads of state in June on their, their progress on the working group. They made it very clear that 
Uh, this exercise is only going to work if it's a, a comprehensive agreement. Uh, if we can achieve a comprehensive agreement, it'll be most significant. And comprehensive means it has to include agriculture. Agriculture is a very important industry uh, in the United States. It's important in Europe as well. Uh, and there are a lot of sensitive trade issues that we have dealt with for many years now in the agricultural sector on both sides of the Atlantic. And so our approach is, and I think this, uh, uh, the EU has a similar approach, is if, if we're going to take this on, we have to deal with the, the toughest issues. It doesn't make any sense to, you know, to carve out the tough issues, put them aside, do the easy things, and leave the hard issues on the table. Um, we, we're, and agriculture presents some sensitive, difficult issues, and uh, we're committed to, s committed to seeing whether we can make progress on those issues as a precondition to launching a, a comprehensive agreement. Okay. And so this is a follow-up question I had of a working group we just received, um, and essentially asking about the commitment. Uh, the person asks, I hear from my DC-based colleagues that there is much less enthusiasm for an EU-US trade agreement than what I hear from the Commission here in Brussels. Do the EU and US share similar levels of ambition and prioritization for concluding an agreement? I think we do. I mean, it's, uh, you know, sometimes you get those questions, it sort of depends who you talk to. <laughs> uh, um, but um, uh, we have been very clear. This is important to the President. It's something that we would like to achieve. But what we're not going to do is launch something that we don't think is going to be successful. So uh, we have to do our homework and make sure that we can, if we decide to launch, we'll have, be able to bring this to a successful conclusion in a, in a short period of time. And stepping back from the policy and back more to the commercial, um, one of the questions we received was, looking at 2013, which countries and industries are most attractive for U.S. companies? Are there openings for automotive, agriculture, healthcare-related products, for example? Sure. You know, that oftentimes people read the headlines uh, and uh, they read about high unemployment, the Eurozone crisis, and it's easy to assume that there's no growth and there's no opportunities in Europe. This is absolutely wrong. Certainly, Europe is uh, struggling to recover from a, a difficult financial crisis, as are we. But there are, are huge pockets of opportunity in this market. Um, you mentioned ICT. ICT is, is clearly an area where we're seeing growth. Uh, the automotive area, at least the supply side, parts and supplies of automotive, uh, are, think, are very promising. And you know, there's always opportunity in crisis. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of austerity policies in Europe, uh, governments trying to deleverage their, uh, uh, their balance sheets, if you will, and cutting budgets. And my own view is that that's going to create some opportunities for business because uh, some of the things that governments have done historically in Europe, they won't be able to afford to do. So there may be opportunities for privatizations, outsourcing of certain areas in areas traditionally uh, done by government. Healthcare is a good example. Um, there is a lot of opportunity in the healthcare industry in Europe uh, that uh, opens opportunities for companies with innovative technologies. I mentioned earlier um, uh, digitization of, uh, of healthcare records. That's coming. Uh, to Europe. It's come in some of the member states. Um, innovative ways of doing businesses that, uh, doing business that government hasn't exploited. Those are prime opportunities in a time of austerity in Europe. Uh, and I think smart companies are going to be able to pursue those. This next question will pick up on your comments on health care. It's a little bit long, but I'm going to try to read it all. As a result of the current economic crisis in the EU, many countries are cutting health care spending budgets dramatically making continuing to do business extremely difficult. It seems that the connection between innovation and opportunities for growth are being ignored in favor of short-term savings opportunities at the expense of quality health care for the public. Do you have any insight into the best way to get this message to those making these decisions? The connection between education, growth, innovation, and paying for innovation seems to be lost on those currently making decisions. <laughs> That's really a, a, a political statement, <laughs> more than a question. But I, I, I think I, I touched on it in the answer to my previous question, which is uh, um, the healthcare situation in 
in Europe is changing because of uh, austerity, and I think it'll it'll create opportunities. Um, you know, far be it from me to make judgments about uh, whether um, or the impact of these changes on uh, the, the long-term quality of health care. Um, that's really not something I can address. But I, I do think that it's going to create opportunities for businesses that know how to exploit uh, opportunities brought about by austerity. We had a couple of, of uh, people ask about the Eurozone crisis. And just to, to paraphrase those questions, there was concerns about reading about recurring meetings in Brussels to address, uh, to address Greece, Ireland, or Spain. But the financial problems have not been resolved. Okay, and the private investment capital, according to this one person, says is staying away from Europe. What is going on financially in Europe? <laughs> well, there's a lot uh, going on financially in Europe. Um, this, this is, it's, it's been a, a fairly serious financial crisis. But as I said earlier, I, the, the European governments um, are responding. Um, to sort of summarize the, the, the problem here, the governments were overlevered. Uh, banks needed to be recapitalized, and there was there were a lack of of institutions that provided uh, both uh, fiscal discipline uh, to governments and also were able to fill some of the gaps in the monetary union that had been uh, created when the euro was uh, was introduced. But Europe is in the midst of crisis, trying to address these issues. Uh, they've uh, they're working to set up a banking union. They're working to put. Uh, uh, mechanisms in place to recapitalize the banks, to shore up uh, some of these governments. Um, these are complex issues. It'll take a, a while uh, to get them resolved. But again, for businesses interested in, in uh, doing business here in Europe, it's important to get beyond the headlines and understand, sure, uh, there's a financial crisis in Europe. We're having financial difficulties in the United States. But where are the opportunities? Um, when I was in the, in the investment world, oftentimes uh, situations of distress provided your most compelling business opportunities when uh, many people would shy away. But those who are smart and can understand, uh, look behind the headlines and figure out where things are going and where the true opportunity is, uh, will do fine. I can see that we have about 50 people signed in watching the call, but we don't exactly have the questions flowing in yet. So I want to encourage the people who are watching this to, uh, to ask some more questions. We have a couple more to go, but an opportunity exists to ask, ask Ambassador Kennard questions if you'd like to type in some questions right now. Uh, with that, go to another question we received prior to today. It's a question about seeking to export California-made gourmet foods, such as olive oil, to countries in Europe which produce such products. Do you think there is a market for U.S.-made artisan food products in Europe? And how does one go about getting started in such a project? <laughs> well, I'm a Californian, so I, I have an, a personal interest in seeing uh, some of the good California agriculture get uh, exported to Europe. Um, again, you know, you have to look at it almost product by product. But we did have a, a really important success uh, with Europe uh, in, in recent months. We signed an agreement uh, on organic products, organic agricultural products, where we were able to come up with uh, harmonized standards on how we certify organic products. I think that's going to open some opportunities for U.S. exporters to Europe. It'll make it easier for them to get their products accepted in this marketplace. And uh, Europeans love good food. <laughs> so um, I, I expect that they'll, uh, uh, that agreement will open up some opportunities. Are there any resources available um, here at the mission or in Washington that might be able to help uh, a person who is interested in exporting agricultural products to the EU? Sure. Uh, the Department of Agriculture. We have uh, a large uh, group of people who work at our mission in Brussels who day-to-day -day study all of the agricultural regulations uh, uh, put out by the EU institutions, uh, particularly the European Commission. And they can provide you advice. Uh, you um, get in touch with them. Uh, tell them the products that you're interested in exporting, and they will tell you uh, what the, uh, the regulatory situation is. They'll give you some insight as to um, uh, perhaps what other companies are doing uh, to export uh, products in that sector. So yeah, there, there are lots of resources for you in that area. One of the questions that um, 
one often hears in Europe is about data privacy and, and, and people expressing concerns about the European approach to data privacy and what kind of, frankly, dangers that might present for U.S. businesses. Can you address what it is that the U.S. government is doing to try to address the, the parent bridge between, or gap between the European approach to data privacy and the U.S. approach to data privacy? Sure, Joe. We have a very robust dialogue with Europe on uh, the whole range of data privacy issues from commercial data privacy to uh, data privacy issues that arise in the, in the area of law enforcement, the sharing of data among law enforcement officials. You know, we have a unique opportunity here because both the EU and the U.S. are updating their data privacy laws to take into account changes in technology. You know, the last 10 years have been extraordinary with the advent of social networking technology that has uh, become a feature of our daily lives. And the privacy laws really haven't kept up. So uh, President Obama announced uh, that he wants uh, to update our laws. He's released what uh, is called our Comprehensive Privacy Blueprint, which will update our laws. At the same time, the European Union uh, is in the midst of a legislative process to update their laws, which haven't been reformed since 1995. Um, it really is a historic opportunity to find ways for our privacy regimes to be interoperable because they're, the regimes are structured differently. We have uh, our privacy laws are more interstitial, meaning that they, um, they reside in uh, different statutory authorities, uh, uh, various uh, sectoral uh, areas. So in the United States, privacy is governed by different statutes uh, based on health care, uh, finance, other areas, telecoms. Uh, Europe has taken uh, more of a centralized approach. Uh, and it's a difference of process, but not necessarily of outcomes. And I'm convinced that we both offer a very high level of privacy protection for individuals. and. We have an opportunity to harmonize our systems so that, you know, while they may not be in perfect harmony, at least they'll be compatible. So that companies doing business in the United States and Europe don't have to worry about complying with different regimes, which is, uh, you know, it's expensive and it, uh, it, it, it creates confusion for companies and consumers. So we're working very hard with uh, the EU now and to, to uh, uh, to, tr to try to find ways that we can harmonize our systems. Mm -hmm. okay, we're going to change gears with this next subject. Um, <coughs> do you see any issues in investing in the EU in the near term given the political unrest in Syria? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, the uh, Syria is, is not uh, one of the major trading partners of Europe. Uh, we've been very pleased uh, with our cooperation with the EU on a, on a security and foreign policy uh, perspective in, uh, uh, in, in trying to um, uh, put pressure on the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, uh, so that uh, we can avert the humanitarian crisis and, 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 and basically uh, 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 try to improve the situation there. But I, I really, if you're an investor in Europe, uh, there are many more things to worry about <laughs> than Syria right now. Next question we've received is, what assistance is available at the mission or in Washington for a trade association that might be interested in launching a conference or trade show in Europe to help the trade association's U.S. member companies explore new business opportunities in Europe? Well, I'm glad to hear that people are, um, are, are thinking about uh, these, these kind of uh, efforts. Um, I think the first thing to do would be to get in touch with our foreign commercial service uh, uh, people here in the, in the mission in Brussels. Because we work day to day with a number of trade associations, both in Europe and the United States. And I think it'd be important to at least initially survey who's out there and who's doing what. Um, some of the trade associations operating in Brussels uh, are 
uh, more generalists. They represent a broad range of industries. They tend to be the larger ones. And then you have the more specialized ones. And anyone considering um, setting up a conference or expanding a, a trade association here, I think the first thing to ask is, um, who else is doing it? Who can I ally with? Who can I partner with? Um, is, is there a need? And our, our people here at the mission could certainly help you with that. Next question is, has declining liquidity in the European banking system affected financing for U.S. exporters? What does the future hold, especially as Europe moves to implement increased capital requirements of Basel III? Hmm. Well, the, the banking crisis in Europe has uh, put pressure on all businesses, but particularly s uh, small and medium-sized businesses uh, as they have uh, uh, tried to get financing for their operations. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a problem. I don't know specifically how that has affected U.S. exporters because they have you know more options. They can access our export import bank. They have uh, access to uh, financing from the U.S. So I'm, I'm not sure whether the the banking crisis in Europe has how dramatically that has affected them. But we see every day here that. Uh, small and medium-sized businesses have had trouble. Um, I, I just see from my old business, I was uh, in the private equity world, and it is, it is tougher to, to get leverage for, for buyouts in Europe. It's because the, the banks are, uh, have been going through a um, uh, pretty serious crisis. They've had to recapitalize. Basel III, as you mentioned, is, uh, is a part of this. But uh, you know, this, th this is a, a cyclical issue. I'm confident that over time, uh, these banks will, will get back on their feet and be able to provide financing again. Can you address um, the issue of European regulations on airline admissions? And there's been a lot in the media on that recently, and Congress mm -hmm. being quite upset, and then EU upset, the Congress is upset, but the EU are sort of purporting to be able to tax air carriers from around the world on emissions that are emitted outside of Europe. What is going to be the impact on business? Are we going to be able to fly to Europe in the future if this doesn't get resolved? <laughs> well, uh, global warming is a serious problem. Our president is committed to, uh, to working on it. And um, the, the controversy that I think you're referring to is the, um, the legislation that was passed by the uh, the European institutions uh, uh, a few years ago, which put in place a, an emissions trading regime that governed not only Europe but also imposed um, restrictions on uh, on all carriers uh, flying into and out of Europe. And while we we certainly embraced the goal, we felt that particularly since it applied to our airlines and and it wasn't our legislation that there's a better way to do this, and this is through um, a multilateral global forum. Uh, so we're in very in, uh, intense discussions with the EU. I'm pleased to report that recently the EU decided to delay its own legislation uh, and to see if this issue can be resolved in an international forum. There's an um, international organization that deals with these issues known as ICAO. Uh, and we're hopeful uh, that we'll be able to work with the EU and, and, and other global partners. Everyone's affected, everyone who flies to Europe, which are you know, most of the EU's major trading partners. And we'd like to have a, uh, uh, a resolution of this that uh, is worked through a global organization. Had a question. Um, can the ambassador discuss phytosanitary, phytosanitary barriers to trade? Are they decided country by country or at the EU level or both? Most of them are now decided at the EU level. The EU has competency over these issues. Um, and they're, they're vitally important to trade. And when I mentioned earlier uh, some of the uh, difficult issues that we have to work through with the EU on agriculture, many of them deal with these phytosanitary standards. Um, and so most of the focus of our work is with the European Commission, which, uh, again, um, passes most of this regulation. Um, and um, here again, it's a situation where we feel that we both have uh, high standards uh, for food safety, uh, but that we sometimes have disagreements as to 
how we should implement those standards. Uh, and it's an area like a lot of the things we work on uh, with the EU where we need to uh, find agreement on equivalent outcomes, you know, is, uh, uh, find a way to kind of harmonize our system so that the flow of trade can continue. Uh, we have uh, a number of, of products uh, in the agricultural sector which uh, we just can't export to Europe. Uh, and uh, we, we, we need to resolve these issues, uh, hopefully, as part of a, of a comprehensive agreement. One of the stereotypes one hears is that the EU has embraced the precautionary principle, and as a result, it's just a break on innovation in Europe, and it's very difficult, while they have some great universities here, it's very difficult to commercialize any of the innovation that may be existing in the laboratory or in a university <coughs> setting because of the precautionary approach, uh, pre precautionary principle sort of guiding the EU's approach to regulation. Can you comment on that? Sure. I've, um, I've spent a fair amount of time trying to understand the precautionary principle. Um, I'm a former regulator myself. As you mentioned, I was, a, I, I, I was a, a telecoms regulator for the United States in the Clinton administration. So I, you know, I've, I've spent a good number of years of my life as a regulator studying regulation. I actually think that, that what regulators do is always try to predict risk and outcomes. And so what the precautionary principle, in my view, sometimes does is it, it is a, sometimes I think it's a regulatory cop-out. You know, it's if, if you're not willing to make judgments about risk, uh, you're unwilling to accept any level of risk, and as a result, um, oftentimes you become overly cautious. So what we have tried to do in a number of different uh, arenas here is to identify sector by sector what are the risks, what are the impacts, uh, and try to calibrate with regulators here in the EU how we view the risk, how they re re view the risk, and ultimately try to come up with at least compatible outcomes. That's really the goal here. I've concluded that it doesn't serve our interests very much to, uh, to try to categorize the precautionary principle uh, in pejorative terms. It's over-regulatory, it's overly cautious. It's really just a, a way that regulators pick a point on a scale of risk and determine whether they're going to approve a product or not. So the real key is understanding what that point is and whether you can, um, can agree or disagree. On, uh, on what the assessment of risks are. We've also heard the President speak quite a bit about the pivot to Asia um, with, I think, in Europe, that implication of that is commonly understood that the pivot implies pivoting away from Europe toward Asia, and that causes some concern in Europe. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I think it has caused concern in some quarters, but I think that concern is lessening. I think when the President first announced this policy, there was a lot of concern here that uh, uh, the United States government didn't care about Europe, they were turning away from Europe. But it's, it's not true at all. What we want to do is not uh, pivot away from Europe, we want to we pivot with Europe to Asia because it's not only in our interests for many reasons to spend uh, more of our time building alliances in that region, but it's also in Europe's interest. And our goal is to link arms with Europe and, um, uh, and create new and uh, deeper alliances with countries in, uh, uh, in the Asia region. And I think we're making success on that. Uh, uh, just in July, uh, Hillary Clinton and Kathy Ashton, who was the, uh, the top diplomat in, uh, in Europe, uh, signed a, a statement in Phnom Penh, in Cambodia, where they committed to working together on a number of uh, issues related to, to Asia. So, I, you know, I, I think that we're making progress. There's, there's a greater understanding that as the world changes, as we see the emergence of, of powerful new economies in the East, it's in our mutual self-interest with, with Europe to spend more time focusing on that region. So we have someone proposing um, an answer to the Eurozone crisis and asking for your comment. Uh, your Excellency, Your Excellency, do you agree that the only final solution to the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis is the federalization of the debt, and do you think that German taxpayers would eventually agree to that? 
Oh, I don't think I want to speculate about that, you know, quite frankly. Look, there are a lot of solutions that have been, uh, 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 been offered by a lot of different quarters on how to solve this problem. But I think ultimately this is a problem that Europe's going to have to solve on its own. We believe they have the resources to deal with it, and I, th I think they will, will, but they'll do it in, in their own way. Um, they won't necessarily become, nor do they want to become, the United States of Europe. Um, it's, they have a different history, a, a, a different structure. Um, but we are pleased that we've seen uh, in, in recent months some you know, real commitment and, and progress towards solving these issues. And we want to be supportive wherever we can. We're starting to wind things down. I wanted to give anyone the opportunity, if you have any more questions, please submit more questions. We're starting to run low on questions. So by all means, please submit more questions if you have them. If you don't have them, we can always end it a little early tonight. It's a rainy, cold night in Brussels this evening. Ambassador Kennard has Secretary Clinton and the Attorney General here tomorrow, so I'm sure he's quite busy. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk one hears, in Brussels at least, on the impact of the EU's approach to regulating the environment um, and taking a more, what some in the U.S. may view as a more extremist approach to regulating the environment, things like environmental footprinting and, and, and wanting to ban products that are commonly used in the United States. Can you comment on any concerns U.S. businesses might have on the EU's approach to regulatory, regulating the environment? Yeah, again, you know, it depends on, on, on the issue, but we, we have expressed a number of concerns um, uh, about some of the environmental regulation here. I mentioned one, the uh, emissions trading system. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's, it, sometimes it's a debate not about um, outcomes or results, but about process. Uh, and uh, what we try to do in many cases is convince the EU that um, we share their concerns. We just may do it a different way. Um, and, but ultimately, we're all in this together, and we want to uh, protect our citizens and have a, you know, a, a, um, uh, a, a clean environmental standards. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that there are areas certainly of difference. And one of the, uh, the things that we're seeing um, quite different in the U.S. and Europe is their approach to uh, exploiting natural gas reserves. You know, we have made the decision in the United States that uh, uh, we want to pursue um, through uh, fracking and, and other uh, 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 technologies um, access to natural gas. And it's, you know, it's been really effective. We're, um, we're lessening our, our, our dependence on foreign oil. We're becoming actually a net exporter now of natural gas. Uh, it's been, become really a game changer for, uh, for our economy and our, our use of, of energy. And I think there's a real sense of, uh, I sense of, uh, a real sense of urgency for Europe to, to get a handle on these issues, uh, these environmental issues, because it's, it's important to their economy and their future. We do a fair amount of work now with the European Union, uh, specifically the Commission on uh, Electric Vehicles. Um, why is that? Is that uh, electric vehicles a priority for the U.S. government? And if so, why? And what might be the implications for U.S. businesses of our active cooperation with the EU on electric vehicles? Uh, well, it's, it's certainly a priority for our president. Um, he uh, establishes a goal to, to uh, get more electric vehicles on the road. Um, and he's working very hard and successfully so to make sure that uh, our automobiles are more fuel efficient. And electric vehicles are, you know, one, one solution to the, the, uh, uh, the energy problem in the United States. And so uh, it's an exciting new, new industry. Uh, Europe is, uh, is pursuing it as well. So we have an opportunity to come up with, again, harmonized standards for electric vehicles and create um, uh, a market for our, our, our vehicles, which includes both the United States and Europe, 800 million consumers. Um, and ideally um, uh, present a standard to the rest of the world that you know, would be very compelling. So we've spent a lot of time through the Transatlantic Economic Council and other ways to, uh, to, to work through our standard setting agencies in Europe and the United States to come up with some, some compatible standards on electric vehicles. Um, you know, everybody who travels uh, to Europe um, is uh, annoyed by the fact that they have to carry a different plug <laughs> for their electric socket. Well, the same concept applies to elect 
electric vehicles. Um, so we've got to find ways that we can have harmonized standards so that uh, our automobile manufacturers can produce vehicles more efficiently uh, for the European market and vice versa. A lot of companies in the U.S. now are beginning to uh, invest in products using nanomaterials. A lot of R&D going into the use of nanomaterials. You're beginning to see broader commercialization of products with nanomaterials. And it's an area that's not yet subject to a significant amount of regulation in the United States. Um, what is the European approach to nanotechnology? And is there going to be compa compatible approaches between the U.S. and the EU uh, to nanotechnology? Their approach is evolving, and so is ours. Nano is a really exciting new, new field. And I found that it's much easier to come up with harmonized regulatory approaches for new technologies when you don't have uh, a lot of legacy regulation and stakeholder interests that are you know, uh, uh, hardened in stone. So we've identified nanotechnology as one of the areas where we can uh, get in on the ground floor, if you will, early on in the process, find ways that we can come up with compatible approaches so that our, our companies can, uh, can uh, avoid having to deal with uh, the regulatory issues in dealing in, in uh, uh, doing business in the transatlantic marketplace. In my position in the econ section at USEU, um, I hear also concerns expressed by businesses about access to raw materials and, and certain raw materials that are indispensable for some of the new and innovative products that are at the centerpiece of, of, of what we believe is for green technology and, and job and technology mm -hmm. that will create jobs. And the EU thinks exactly the same thing. Um, how much work are we doing with the EU, if any, on trying to come up with a, an approach to raw materials that ensures a secure supply of raw materials for our, our companies? We're doing a lot. And then this, this is a, an area where our interests are almost perfectly aligned because much of the raw materials uh, uh, and uh, the rare minerals that we need access to, uh, are we're getting them from outside the U.S. and outside of Europe. And so we have a huge interest in linking arms uh, and making sure that uh, those countries that produce these materials um, do so in a fair and transparent way. Uh, so we've, uh, uh, we're working with the EU, um, not only here in Brussels, but you know, more importantly at before the WTO to make sure that um, our companies continue to have access to those materials at, uh, uh, at fair prices. Okay, Mr. Bess, we're going to have this be your last question and then you can provide any final thoughts if you want. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating tonight. We've tried to get uh, almost all the questions and we'll be following up via email with a few people who had specific questions about access to or entering the market with details from the Foreign Agriculture Service or the Foreign Commercial Service um, as relevant. Uh, last question is, can you address uh, the EU approach to intellectual property? Will my intellectual property rights be protected in Europe? And what is the status of the single patent in the EU? Well, this is also an area there where there's a, you know, a lot a lot of debate and fluidity because uh, technology is, you know, providing a lot of pressures on, uh, uh, on the intellectual property system that we've all grown up with. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, an intellectual property working group where we have uh, uh, a formal channel for working with Europe to, to harmonize our, our approaches, not only w with respect to regulation in the United States and Europe, but equally importantly to make sure that we can be effective in dealing with third countries where, you know, f uh, frankly, uh, European and American companies have more problems in protecting their intellectual property than they do in Europe or, or the United States. So this is a, a, a really a, a important area and one, again, where we're pretty, we're pretty closely aligned uh, with our, uh, our partners here in Europe. In terms of a patent system, uh, Europe is uh, in the process, it's been going on for quite some time, to come up with a unitary patent system for Europe. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons why they should do this. It'll make it easier for entrepreneurs, particularly small businesses, uh, to get patents. They'll be able to get their patents enforced throughout Europe. Um, Europe is close to getting this done. It's not finished yet. They've been working on it on a while and we're uh, on it for a while and we're certainly encouraging them um, to move ahead with it because frankly it'd be good for American businesses too. 
And with that, Mr. Bester, do you have any final words that you want to say to the audience, or should we wrap things up? Well, I just want to thank people for, uh, for participating, particularly those who uh, survived through <laughs> to this point in, the, in our webinar. We sincerely hope that you've gotten a taste of what we can do for you here in Brussels. We have a lot of resources. Uh, we, are, we are here to help you. We hope that we'll be able to continue this dialogue in other ways, uh, online. Come and see us. Uh, call us up because uh, we, we really want to help expand this relationship and we need the help of the private sector to do it. So thank you. Okay, we're going to have uh, a chat room open uh, online for anyone who wants to participate in that afterwards. And if you want to send us additional questions for the ambassador or others in the mission, it might be able to be helpful. We'd be happy to do that as well. So signing off from Brussels, thank you very much. Thank you.